Hi, this is April from Annapest, and you're listening to The Mosh Pit on Sin. April Hutchins is a multi-instrumentalist behind the solo project Anna Pest, a guitarist for Melavon. She released her debut album, Forlorn, in August, and produces a number of genre-bending covers for her YouTube channel. Uh, April, thank you so much for joining me. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. No problem. Now, let's start very simple. Why the name Anna Pest? I mean, it's kind of a very human name for a band compared to you know, most other band names and even most solo projects. Certainly. Uh, it actually came about as a pun on the word anapest, which is the name for a certain um, rhyming structure. Uh, not rhyming structure, sorry, uh, poetic structure, um, in which, uh, which, which follows two unstressed syllables followed by a stress sy- syllable. So uh, a good example would be, um, "'Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house.'" you see what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, uh, I don't know, I thought it sounded fun and it suited me, so I went with it. Now, let's go back to the very beginning. How'd you get started in music? Um, I originally wanted to compose music for video games, um, and I started coming up with sort of jingles in my head that I wasn't able to play as early as, I guess, 13 or 14 years old. Um, so I was a self-taught guitarist. I dabbled with piano for a little while as well. Um, I started actually playing and writing my own music in 2008. Um, And then I started Melavon originally as a solo project in 2009. Eventually got bored of that, so brought some more people in. And here I am now doing my own thing again, I suppose. What are some of your influences? I I, I think this is... I ask a lot of questions to a lot of different people, but I find this always the most fascinating thing because it gives an insight to kind of what... What really makes you as, as a musician? So what are some of the bands that you're drawn influence? F- for generally, because you listen to a lot of different stuff. I think that's pretty obvious from Anna Pest yeah. and Melavon and all the covers you do. So, yeah, if you want to talk generally and maybe more specifically about Anna, uh, Anna Pest, uh, Forlorn Later, maybe, I don't know, we can divide it like that. Yeah, sure thing. Um, all right, so I guess the big one would be Nintendo 64 era video game music, actually. Um, as well as 90s pop music, uh, a lot of alternative rock and new metal from the 90s, uh, Swedish melodic death metal like In Flames, Dark Tranquility, At the Gates, that sort of thing, and uh, really all manner of different styles of metal. Now, what, what is it about Nintendo 64 music that attracts you? Because I think a lot of people hearing that now who maybe didn't go through the experience of all those games kind of would say that's incredibly simplistic, kind of very at the time. It, 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 you know, it's, it's simple music. What, why would you be concerned with that kind of stuff? I think it is the minimalism in a large part that attracts me and also the, um, the tendency for the, the tunes to get stuck in your ear. You know, they're all great earworms, very catchy, uh, very pretty. Um, all things that, I guess, uh, continue on in my musical taste today. Now, in terms of... Uh, some of your influences specifically on the, the, the guitar work you do, the vocals you do. Is there any particular people you have in mind who maybe you model yourself after even? Uh, yeah, for sure. In terms of guitar playing, I, I know I get compared to uh, the guitar players from At The Gates a lot. Uh, I tend to do a lot of octave and string jumping, um, very solid rhythm work, um, in terms of vocals, I'd say my biggest inspiration is Shagrith from Dimu Borgir. Mm. Um, yeah, I just, I love the way his voice sounds, and he's probably the, the person I was first trying to emulate when I started screaming. Um, yeah, he's, a, he's definitely the main one that comes to mind. Now, the, the, the obvious, uh, it's a great influence for Forlorn, you know, which is heavy on the black metal influence, but how does that feed into... Yeah. Things which you wouldn't normally associate with Shagrath, like the, the, the pop covers you do. Right. It's, it's kind of a weird mix, I realize. Um, uh, so sometimes it, it seems incongruous, for sure. Um, but I think that's, that's part of what makes it sound maybe a bit interesting and different, is, is the fact that my vocal style isn't what you'd expect to hear alongside a, a pop metal instrumental. Mm. Um, so yeah, but it's, it's really, uh, it's the main style of vocal I know how to do. So I just kind of roll with it most of the time. 
What made you start Adam Pesh? You say Melavon started as a solo project. Why another solo project when you, you said that was something you got bored of? Yeah. Um, well, it got to the point where I just had an excess of written material that my band wasn't as invested in as I, but that I thought was still good enough that it deserved to be heard. Um, and I wasn't about to, you know, force them to learn songs that I had written that they weren't invested in, right? So I figured um, I, it got to the point that I needed an independent outlet for my creative energy. Why the covers? So, like, you, obviously you're writing your own music, but why, yeah. what, what made you decide to go with covers? Is that something you always have been working on, or, or why covers? Um... Well, I've, I've always enjoyed interpreting other artists' music. I find myself listening to um, a great song and I'll go, ooh, I wish they'd maybe added this little bit here or done this differently. So it gives me the chance to sort of re reimagine songs that I like. Um, and it, it's a good expulsion of creative energy. And um, I, guess, I guess practically speaking, uh, when you're starting off as a solo artist, it's really hard to get noticed. And I figured covering music I enjoyed would be a, a good way to sort of um, reach out to potential listeners. Now, you produce a lot of covers. I was kind of amazed by how prodigious your output was. With all that kind of goes into that, how do you, how do you manage it? Um, it's really just a matter of discipline. Um, I'm, I'm a huge perfectionist, and in setting uh, the goal of getting a cover out every week, I can sort of train myself to let things go more easily rather than just letting them stew uh, for months at a time. Um, and it's, it's not terribly hard. I tend to get inspired pretty easily, and I have a lot of fun doing it. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, uh, I might be slowing things down a little bit. I'm at the start of a school year, and I have a lot of original music that I want to put more time into. So I might slow down with the covers a bit right now, but it's... They're definitely fun to do, and I don't find them particularly difficult or time-consuming. Now, you take various approaches to making a cover, including doing an instrumental version, one with your own vocals, and some with the original vocals. How do you decide, or what, what, is there any kind of uh, cues that you get from music that dictates what approach you're going to take with a particular song? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if I feel the vocal melody of a song translates well into guitar... That's usually the first approach I'll go with, since guitar is probably the instrument I'm most comfortable with. Um, if a song's vocal melody is less, I'll say, uh, important, like if it's mirroring the melodies already being performed by the other instruments, um, but the vocals are still important to the song, rhythmically speaking, I'll give it a shot with my own vocals, um, assuming I feel I'm up to it. Um, and if I don't feel I can do the original vocals justice, either by translating the melody onto guitar or by performing them myself, I just include the original vocal track. Bleed um, slash Sean Paul, uh, the Meshuggah yes. Cross uh, cover. How'd that come about? Because that's, that's incredibly interesting. How'd you figure out that they could actually work? Particularly because Meshuggah, they're interesting songs. They're kind of hard to get into, even on their own. For sure, yeah. Um, the thing about Meshuggah, though, is that most of the stuff they write is in 4-4, and if you can kind of get past the crazy rhythmic complexity of the guitar parts, um, I actually find some of their music almost danceable. Um, and I, I remember I, I was listening to Temperature from Sean Paul and imagining what it would sound like as a metal cover because the instrumental for that song is so sparse, and I figured it would be really difficult to translate. So I started imagining just other riffs that could maybe back up Sean Paul's voice effectively. And for some reason, the first one that came to mind was the main riff uh, for Bleed from Michigan. So I grabbed an acapella and I grabbed an instrumental of Bleed and I smushed them together just to see what would happen. And I thought it was brilliant. So uh, I recorded an instrumental version of Bleed and put Sean Paul's vocals over it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. It's kind of, I was because I was going through the covers and like I'm not I'm not really big into pop. I'm listening to a few of them, and then I see "Bleed" by Michelle. I'm like, yes, I'm like, oh, what Sean Paul? Oh, okay, and I, I was amazed that it just worked so well. It kind of just clicked. It was really good. Yeah, it's a really strange mix, but I, I think it worked in the end. Now you've covered more thoroughly the works of uh, Tattoo and the soundtrack of Donkey Kong '64. 
why those particular works? I know obviously we've gone into say you're a big fan of Nintendo music, but why specifically in that instance Donkey Kong sixty four? Right, that was probably my favorite game when I was younger, and uh, those melodies have been stuck in my head since I played the game as a little kid. Um, as for the Tattoo album, it's definitely my favorite pop album, and uh, probably the one that's influenced my composition style more than any other. Uh, so I really just wanted to pay them tribute, and um, I also felt the music would translate well into metal. Um, and it, it, was, it was just really fun to do. Uh, it didn't feel like a chore to do them at all. To some people in the metal community, that there's some opinionated people out there that kind of are very aggressively against sort of mainstream anything they perceive as mainstream. Have you gotten any of that kind of response to any of your music? For sure, I find it ironic because metal's always been about controversy and breaking mm-hmm. rules, right? But then, um, you know, they have that other very strict set of rules that you're expected to follow if. Uh, if you want to be part of the cool kids team, right? So I, I just I just find that weird how that works out. Uh, and I do get a bit of flack from time to time, either from people who really like extreme metal and not much else, and also from people who like the original songs I'm covering but don't like what I did to them. Um, but I'm not really trying to appeal to people like that. I'm I'm more interested in appealing to people with different various music tastes and who enjoy fun music so what what i find interesting about that whole thing of people getting very 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 animated about some of those things is heavy metal music and some of the associated styles are very much music for alienated people from mainstream society and then they get angry at other people and try to alienate them from their own sort of sort of so focus of alienation. It's just very odd and very, it lacks an incredible amount of self-awareness. That, that's exactly it. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm pushing against a little bit. I'm, I'm always very vague on kind of like how covers work because a lot of people cover stuff on YouTube. But like, is it, what's, what's the legal situation? Do you, do you have to uh, credit people or is there certain obligations? How, how does that all work? Right. Um, I only cover songs that are permitted under YouTube's music policies, so I never run into any trouble. Um, Occasionally, one of my videos will be monetized or made unviewable in Germany or Switzerland, but that's about it. Uh, If you wanted to cover a song from a band that has certain protections on their music uh, that YouTube can't penetrate, um, like the Eagles or ACDC, for instance, then you'll run into more trouble. People kind of take lots of different paths when they're making a cover some it's kind of i feel like it's pointless for the cover because it's almost an exact replica and some make really different music that you could almost classify as a different song what do you think the key to making a good cover Um, Personally, I think it's important to stay true to the elements of the original composition that you feel are the most important, whether it's the melody, the sonic vibe, uh, or the vocal syncopation, while at the same time imbuing it with your signature style and instrumentation. Um, I think the best covers are the ones that are recognizable as being covers, while at the same time fitting seamlessly into the cover artist's oeuvre. You put a lot of music out over the past nine months as Anna Pest. Two albums with Melvon, uh, previous to that. But this is your first solo album. Did you you approach that any differently than the music you've previously written? Um, A little bit, I guess. Um, What Anna Pest has really given me is the freedom to explore a lot of different styles. Um, And I guess I approached it... um, uh, with with, on, with more of a theme in mind, um, more of a precise thing that I, I was going for, um, rather than just writing a collection of songs and putting them together. Why the black metal influence? What, what caused you to say, this particular album, I'm going to be heavily influenced by those kind of bands? Um, it was really a matter of... I, I mean, it's not as though I sat down and said, I'm going to write a black me- mm. metal album now. Um, I wrote some of the songs on Forlorn as far back as 2013. Um, I really like exploring different genres. I always have, and I tend to switch back and forth between them on a whim. 
um, my process in producing an album tends to rely on grouping together a set of songs of a similar style that I've written at various points and then coming up with a plan to fill in the blanks. In the notes it's for the album, it says there was influenced by the works of Silencer, Bethlehem, Dark Fortress and Angelox, which are some really, really amazing band. Angelox in particular is my favourite. I think Silencer's Death Pierce Me is kind of one of those albums which sort of stands on its own in terms of how I, brilliant I think it is. Absolutely, yeah. I love that album. Oh, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, it's kind of, it's, it's scary in a little way. <laughs> um how do those albums kind of inform the process? Do you like, do you say, all right, I really love this, I want to use this particular element, or is it kind of more of a subconscious thing that these are the things that I've, I kind of like and they're the same, but it's not necessarily a conscious, conscious thing? Um, I guess it's a mix of conscious and unconscious. There are definitely um, elements from each of those bands' works that I, I really enjoyed and... Um, kind of went, ooh, I, I should maybe try something like that sometime. Um, but a, a lot of my songwriting is m- mostly organic, I would say. You know, it's, uh, I'm writing a song and then I'll say, ooh, wouldn't it be cool if I incorporated something like that? Like, for instance, I, I really adore the strange, tortured brilliance of Silencer's vocal performance. Um, and I when I was writing the song Nick Dephobic mm. and I, I, I get into this kind of slow breakdown part in the middle of the song, I thought it would be really fun to do some crazy demented shrieks uh, kind of off in the distance like their vocalist does. In terms of the lyrical content of the album, I, I kind of, and you know, correct me if I'm misinterpreting because obviously the person listening is very much different to the person writing. <laughs> But I kind of felt they were a bit more bleak than in your EP, whereas like that was more you know, there was darkness. But you had the sort of power to overcome it. But in this one, it's almost embracing the darkness. Um, talk a bit about the lyrics and what was the intention behind them. Right. Um, I guess I, I just really wanted to explore a different set of characters and narratives. Um, the whole light at the end of the tunnel vibe, which is what I usually tend to gravitate towards with my material didn't really fit in with the darkness of the music that I wrote for Forlorn. So I chose to draw from darker sources and my sense of latent pessimism. (laughs) Um, Every song tells a different story. And while a lot of them are informed by scary experiences I've had or my personal philosophies, a lot of them also draw from demonology, especially Mm -hmm. in Christian mythology and um, supernatural themes. I've always felt the image of Christ crucified and the general experience of the crucifixion is really powerful imagery, regardless, you know, I'm very thoroughly atheist, uh, atheistic, <laughs> but I, for me, I always just feel very kind of moved when I think of that image. Did you get into a particular mindset when you were writing uh, Golgotha? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I actually wrote that song from the point of view of one of the two thieves Mm. crucified at Jesus's side. Um, I I find it really tragic how their sides of the story are so unexplored and that nobody even seems to be able to agree on their names. So I tried to get inside um, the thief's head and try to work through what he might have been thinking or feeling as he suffered, um, even tackling the possibility that he might have been innocent and wrongly tried as a thief. I, I really just think um, the fact that crucifixion ever even existed as a form of pus- punishment is just uh, a testament to the cruelty that humans are capable of. And it's it's definitely uh, a powerful image and one that I, I didn't want to deal with lightly. Uh, religion, you know, obviously I think it's pretty clear, is, is a prominent part of the album because you include what quotations in the, from the Bible, references to God, demons and hell. Is that something you bring from your own sort of religious experience upbringing or is that something that is kind of an interest of yours as opposed to something you've directly experienced? It's definitely more of an interest. Um, I'm, I don't consider myself religious uh, per se. I, I've studied theology quite extensively in university um, and I, I used to be very spiritual I was part of a group of students in my college who would meditate, do visualization exercises, sometimes little rituals, and we would research different pagan faiths and their beliefs. 
Um, and some of my lyrics are definitely informed by my time with that group and the ideas we shared. But it's it's not based in my personal religious beliefs, per se. Now, for, Florence covered art, artwork is interesting because my instinctual response to the naked female form of heavy metal artwork would often be to see it as demeaning, exploitative, or even offensive because, unfortunately, that's what it tends to be. You know, histori- Absolutely. Historically, you look back and it's not it's not a good record, unfortunately. Coming from a very different perspective, could you talk a little bit about the design the decisions that went into making that uh, cover artwork for Forlorn? For sure. Um, <clears throat> while it can be extremely demeaning, uh, especially uh, the, the image of female nudity, that is, when it's employed uh, for exploitative purposes, at the same time, I think nakedness can be very empowering and a huge political statement, especially when a female artist willingly presents her body as part of her artwork. Mm. Um, ironically, that's also when they tend to get the most flack for it, because, of course, women aren't supposed to take agency of their bodies, right? Mm. Um, my aim was to channel the character of Baphomet, uh, which is an occult icon who is traditionally represented as the Sabbatic goat, an androgynous horned figure with the words Salve and Coagula, carved into its arms. Um, It's a figure made up of many contradictory binary elements, male and female, good and evil, breaking down and building up. Mm. And I felt that embodying it, as well as choosing to pose in a state of undress in the first place, gave me the opportunity to engage in a catharsis of the fear and guilt and insecurity I have about my own body and the labels that people put on it. So it's definitely a bold move, but I I entered it with the purest and least exploitative of intentions. And I think that the end result isn't very lewd or titillating at all. I think my presentation, all things considered, is pretty classy and the execution is artistic. And most importantly, it's me, right? (laughs) I I totally agree with that. And what, what I loved about the cover was the fact that I'm kind of, I'm familiar with all demonology and that's that stuff and I, I for some reason I just didn't notice that it was Baphomet and I when I found out when I noticed that I was like wow that's that's kind of deep that's really interesting and I, it's something that you can really appreciate there's a, a there's multiple layers to it absolutely yeah you can look at it as just like ooh, that's a pinup on a black metal album cover or if if you look a little deep deeper and I guess notice some of the small visual cues I incorporated. There's there's definitely another level to it. Now it's interesting that I see the album censured with some delicate tape placement in some locations. What are you th- What are your thoughts on that kind of c- censorship? When it is art, after all, it's not yeah, it's not trying to be titillating, as you said. It's art, and it's you know go back to some of our oldest representations of anything in you know our art in ancient civilization. And it's it's naked people. Exactly, yeah. Um, it was very frustrating. Uh, the art work was rejected by a couple of distributors, so I had to censor it. It wasn't a decision I made of my own volition. It was because I had to. Um, and I find it really upsetting uh, the degree to which the female body is sexualized, even in cases in which it's present, it's presented in an artistic and pretty non-sexual context. And I find it even more upsetting that I was censored where other artists who exploit and objectify the female figure in their cover art, like any number of brutal death metal and deathcore artists, are not censored. Um, There are actually plenty of nipples on iTunes, if you know where to look. But people seem to think that the fact that I'm an underground artist who uses her own and her artwork makes me somehow dirtier, right? It's not good. (laughs) It's not great, no. Uh, but uh, whatever, you know. Yeah. The important thing that's out there. Exactly. Uh, now, this is a solo project, but is there any desire to perform live with any of these tracks? Um, sure, I would love to one day. It's just a matter of finding the right musicians and honing my vocal and guitar skills to be able to perform the songs comfortably live, um, probably, you know, in a good number. Um, either that or I would like to one day write some material that I could perform on my own with the use of looper and effects pedals. Uh, Though I anticipate either of those options will take some time and investment and I'm comfortable just being a studio artist for now. Cool. 
Uh, what are your plans going forward? You mentioned uh, possibly slowing down the covers and focusing on some more original material. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I plan on continuing to explore different styles of music with each new release. I have about five unfinished records up in the air at the moment. Wow. And I'm just trying to crack down and actually finish the darn things. Uh, Melavon, uh, you guys went on to a tour of Eastern Canada earlier this year, and I believe you're working on a new album, is that correct? That is correct, yes. Awesome. Anything you can tell us about it? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a new step, um, I guess in a, a more aggressive, modern direction. Um, we've got almost all the songs finished. There are just one or two that are still kind of up in the air, and we've started rehearsing them as well as recording them. Uh, we're not sure yet when the album will be finished or ready to release, but we're hoping for everything to be ready early next year. So that's definitely coming up. Any final words? Anything you want to say before we uh, wrap this up? Uh, I would say never feel guilty about enjoying what you enjoy and don't make any apologies for it. April Hutchins is uh, Anna Pest and guitarist Melvon. She released her debut album, Full On August. And uh, check her out on YouTube. Uh, we'll have that in the link for, I don't know, whatever we send out. Um, thank you so much for joining me, Anna. You're very welcome.